Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. You know, life's hard. Life's tough. Many times we just want to give up, don't we? There's a lot of times when life comes at us that we just want to give up. We don't want to go any further. We just want to stop. We want to crawl up in a hole somewhere and just give up. It seems like everything and everyone is coming against us. Everything and everyone is coming against us. In the midst of all of this, then the hurts and the scars come, don't it? You know what I'm talking about. There's always either emotional hurts or something like that that bears scars on us or in our hearts. Whether it's at work, whether we're at church, whether we're in a family situation, whatever it may be, we try to do our best. Our best isn't good enough. And then there's come scars and emotions uh, that come with it. The scars and the bruises and the hurts and the emotions, they cut deep, don't they? You know what I'm talking about, folks. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Each one of us have had those scars. Each one of us has had those emotional hurts. And they cut deep. And all we want to do is quit. It's easier to run and hide than stay. It's easier to give up ground instead of standing firm in what you know you're supposed to do. Especially as a church who's wanting to advance into the community of Christ. You know, even this morning with our first service like it is right now, it's easy to have just said, you know what, we're not going to go there. It would have been easy to say, no, we're just going to be comfortable where we are at. We're, we're, we, we've got some scars. We've got some things that has happened. Uh, and we're not going to move forward out into the community. It's been a lot easier. You see, we've got to understand that the church who wants to introduce Christ to a lost and dying world, there's going to be scars. There's going to be hurts. Doesn't matter. They're going to come to each one of us. We get beat up, we get cut, we get discouraged if we don't sustain our strength through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. What we need is perseverance and a first aid kit. That's what we need. We need perseverance and a first aid kit. Perseverance is described as being steadfast in doing something despite the difficulty. Single-mindedness in doing something. What's the first aid kit? The first aid kit is the Word of God. It's the strength of God through the Holy Spirit. It's prayer. And more importantly, it's forgiveness of others and self. Forgiveness of others and self. You see, because most of the scars that we have, most of the emotional hurts, most of the anger and the bitterness that's in our lives is because we don't want to Forgive ourselves or others. Luke is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ in his letter that he has written. He tells us of a super team of Paul and Barnabas. They're on their first missionary journey. They're going out. They have been commended. They have been uh, missioned to go out by the church in Antioch to spread the gospel. And they knew the purpose. They knew the purpose of why they were going because they prayed and they were fasted. And God told them, said, hey, set apart Paul and Barnabas, this super team, if you want to say that, it's, it, Paul and Barnabas was a super team of guys who had hearts that wanted to go out and spread the gospel. So they started planting churches and the word spread and churches started growing. And the church planters were guided by the hand of God to the places where the good news hadn't been preached. That's what church planting does. The next big thing in evangelism is church planting. You plant churches in areas in which people don't know the good news of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit was in empowering them to per persevere even though there was opposition to their ministry. And this morning I want to examine some truths about perseverance and how they can 
uh, apply to our lives, how we can continue to advance not only for kingdom work, but in our in individual lives as well. And when it feels like everything is going against us, we can apply these truths and we can trust God's plan to move forward, even as a church, but even in your individual lives. You see, in our individual lives, when the church is scattered, we need that perseverance, don't we? We need to understand that it's not uh, easy to give up, and we don't need to give up. You see, that's what Satan wants to do. So the first truth I want us to look at is there is per perseverance in the power of the Word of God. Look in chapter 14 of Acts verse 1 in iconium they entered the synagogue of the jews together and they spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed both of the jews and of the greeks but the jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the gentiles and embittered them against the brethren they therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the lord who was testifying to the word of his grace granting the signs and wonders be done by their hands but the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Some, the, some sided with the opposition, some sided with the team. You see, Jesus said that I come to divide. You see, there's no fence riding with Jesus. You're either for him or you're against him. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they become aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe and the surrounding region, and they continued to preach the gospel. In the power of the word, there's perseverance, perseverance in the power of the word. When speaking in the power of the word, something happens. You ever notice that? When you're sitting there and you're talking with folks, about who Jesus is to you and what God's word says to you and, and how you hold on to that word and you understand that that word is true. There's power in your words when you talk to folks. When we speak the truth to people whose hearts are searching for it, great things happen. We see that with Paul in verse 1. They entered, the, they entered the synagogue. Paul still didn't give up on his Jewish friends. He went in there and he started talking to them about Jesus Christ. And what happened? Many people came. Another church was started at that point in that time. Just speaking and communicating with the people about the good news in everyday language. Did you see that? Paul just spoke to them, just like me and you are talking this morning. He spoke to them in everyday language. It wasn't anything over their heads. It wasn't theological, per se. It wasn't something deep. He was just telling them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and who he was as the Messiah. Paul and Barnabas could testify to the scriptures and to a relationship with him. But what happened? Look in verse 2, it said, But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against uh, Paul and Barnabas. What does that word embittered mean? It means it poisoned the minds, folks. That's what it means in the Greek. They went in and they poisoned the, the, the minds of the folks who were kind of riding on that fence, and they, they got them to come over on their side. You see, there's always going to be hearts that are hardened. There's always the ones that's not going to listen. Have you ever dealt with those folks? Maybe you're one of them. Maybe I'm one of them. Sometimes we don't listen, do we? We have that hard-headedness. And, you know, we let other people poison our minds because they're always negative about stuff. doesn't matter. They're always throwing out that poison. They were playing on emotions. You see, I always tell folks, you know what? If you're angry, if you're bitter, whatever it may be that we're uh, talking about, you have to understand, are you playing on emotions or are you playing on the truth? You see, there's two different things. Yes, emotions can be true, but emotions aren't necessarily true. Just because you're angry, just because you're bitter about something, just because you're against something in which maybe the church is doing or uh, 
you know, somebody's trying to tell you about who Jesus is or anything, just because you don't agree with it doesn't mean that it's true. Emotions can play a big part in a lot of different things in trying to spread the gospel. Don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to it. That's what these folks were doing. They were stirring the pot. You ever heard that term, stirring the pot? How my mom and dad always used to tell me, Chris, you're stirring the pot. Just don't even go that way. <laughs> they were intensifying the situation. You know how it is. You get two people together and they start talking real loud about whatever it is, especially about church and about Jesus Christ, happened down at work all the time. You get two people together, and all of a sudden you got 20 people around you. And they're all at you. They're all just firing at you, just saying, hey, you know what? That's not true. I don't want to hear that. You can't say that here. That's what was happening with Paul. Put, put yourself in Paul and Barnabas' place. They went into a new area and started preaching about Jesus Christ. Some came, others started just persecuting them to no end. They poisoned their minds. Even in slander, what did they do? Even in slander, what did Paul and Barnabas do? Look what, what it says in, in verse 3. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. You know what? You can say all you want to about me, they said. You can say, you can tell us, you can threaten us, but we're going to stay here and we're going to teach about Jesus Christ. You see, that's where the perseverance comes in, folks. Most of the time, what we'll do is if somebody challenges us about our relationship with Jesus Christ, what do we do? We take the easy way out. Okay, I'm through. Paul and Barnabas said, uh-uh. You know what? We're going to rely upon the Holy Spirit. We're going to rely upon Jesus. And they spoke boldly and persevered in that reliance of the grace of the Lord. And people from the Jews and the Gentiles came to know the Lord. You see, when we work for the Lord, we're going to find opposition. When you work for the Lord, you're going to find opposition. doesn't matter where you're at. You're going to find it in church. You're going to find it out in the workplace. You're going to find it in your family. You're going to find it in your friends. There's always opposition when you work for the Lord. Why? Because Satan's not going to give up the ground easily. Yes, there is a person, a, a thing that's called Satan. And he's going to do everything he can not to let the gospel get into his realm. He's going to do everything he can to stop it. People don't want to give up their way of living. They don't want to hear the moral end of it. Yet in the power of the Lord and partnering up with him and knowing his word, we can take that bold step to go out and tell them about that. And we can persevere no matter what we do. You see, we can rejoice and we can know that we can rest in him, just as they did. Just as they did. You know, they stayed a long time there. And look in verse 6. They become aware of it. They become aware of what? They wanted to mistreat him. They wanted to stone him. They come aware of it. God gives us wisdom and knowledge to know when to leave. Either the conversation or where we're at. He gives us that prudence. He gives us that knowledge not to hang around. So what did they do? They went to the next city. They moved on. They didn't give up because of the persecution. They moved forward because of the victories. I want you to understand that. They moved forward because of the victory. They saw when they were sitting there spreading the gospel that their time had come to move on. So they were celebrating the victories as they were leaving. See, that's what we should do. We should celebrate the victories, folks. We should celebrate the victories when we see people coming to Christ. We should celebrate the victories when we reach our community for Christ. But there's going to be certain pockets out in that community or in work that they're not going to listen to you. Don't worry about them. Persevere and move forward. Persevere and move forward. Timothy Keller hits the nail on the head when he stated, the greater the effectiveness of the ministry, the greater the resistance of the opposition. 
the more effective that our ministry is, wherever it's here at church, in the community, at work, wherever it may be, there's going to be a greater resistance and opposition to our work. Secondly, there is perseverance in humbleness. There's perseverance in humbleness. Look in verse 8. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him, had seen that he had faith to be made well. And with a loud voice, uh, with a loud voice, Paul said, Stand up, ride on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought out oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostles uh, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach to the, the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own way, yet he did not leave himself without a witness. In that he did good and gave you rains from heavens and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with, your, with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. You see, there's perseverance in humbleness. First of all, I want you to look at this crippled guy, this lame man that Paul is talking about. He was a man who was lame from birth. Everybody knew that this man could not walk from birth. Everyone knew who he was. And if you look deeper in his life, you might find this. If you would sit there and you would think a little bit about that man, or maybe you who had had the opportunity to talk to that man back then, you might find a little bit of hopelessness in that man. You might find a little bit of despair and depression. Why? Because he had to depend upon everybody else. He had to look uh, to see who was going to take care of his needs each and every day. All his needs had to be met by someone. Think about that. You know what? That's not very... Uh, good to, especially to a man, because of our pridefulness. We don't want anybody, we want to take care of others. We don't want anybody to take care of us. But Paul said, look, he said he was listening intensely. Did you see that? He was, he was looking at Paul. He was gazing upon Paul as Paul was telling him about the gospel. And he heard the truth Paul was speaking. And Paul at that point in time, God allowed Paul's spiritual eyes to come into play. He could see that that man had faith. He could see that that man was searching for truth. And God allowed him to be able to heal him through the reliance of Jesus. That crippled man showed perseverance, didn't he? He showed perseverance from however old he was back to when he was a baby. He had to persevere. A lot of people just want to give up, but he persevered through life. Why? Because he always had the hope that maybe, just maybe one day, he may be able to be healed, or he may be able to take care of himself. Let me ask you something this morning. What's crippling you this morning? What is crippling you this morning? Is it bitterness? Are you a lot like this man? Is it hopelessness? Is it bitterness? Is it anger? Is it a lack of faith? Doubting God can use you or this church for his service? Maybe it's doubt. What is it that's crippling you this morning? There's no way we can make a difference. No way we could raise money for a new building. Is that the doubt in your heart? Is it hopelessness or oppression? What's keeping you from walking with the Lord this morning? The good news of Jesus Christ tells us that we have resurrection power, folks. That the, doubt, the doubting that we have in our hearts come from Satan because we have the promises of God. And Jesus says, look, I will be with you always. Don't be afraid. 
if it's my will, you'll see it's my will. And I'll work among you, and I'll show you great things. But you can only understand that if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then something will come into your life that cripples you. But Jesus can heal you of that. You can overcome that in his resurrection power. And then secondly, then, you look at Paul and Barnabas. You know, Paul was out there, and, and he healed that man, and, he, and that man leaped up, it said, and started walking and started rejoicing. And then what happened to the crowd? The crowd said, oh, the gods have come down before us. Oh, the gods, Zeus and, and Hermes, come down before us. Because there was a local legend that said that the gods had come down years and years ago and done the same thing. You know, here's what I want you to look at in perseverance and humbleness. You see, Paul and Barnabas could have set themselves up well. They could have said, hey, you know what, let's take advantage of this. Let's take advantage of this. Let's not give God credit for what he's done. Let's take the credit for ourselves. You with me? We, we do it in life all the time. People always say, oh, Chris, how's your church going down there? How's you, how are you doing all this stuff down here? And the first thing I tell, you, I tell them is this. It's not my church. It's God's church. And it's always going to be his church. And I said, secondly, then it's the people of Waxhaw Baptist Church's church. I just had the privilege of going down and journeying with them. It's not my church. You see, there's many opportunities that we can say, you know, when you have that idea that comes up in a meeting at work, or you have an idea in a family situation, and it comes to you, and it settles everybody down, and everybody says, ah, that's good, that's good. How did you come up with that? A lot of times we say, oh, I just came up with it, it just came to me. When we should be saying, hey, you know what? God gave it to me. You see, it's to his glory. That's what Paul and Barnabas was doing. They humbled themselves and they gave the glory to the living God. King Herod, remember King Herod? He tried to take God's glory. He came out and the people said, he's a God, he's a God. And what happened to him? Five days later, he died. Worms ate him up inside because he tried to take God's glory glory from him. God shares his glory with no one. Why we focus on him? This is his church, not mine. What have you not given him the glory for this morning? What haven't you given him the glory for this morning? Job promotion? Maybe uh, advice? Maybe the authority that he has given you? What is it this morning? that you haven't given him the glory for. And then there is perseverance in persecution. Look in verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go there. And he didn't leave himself without witness in that he did good and he gave you rains from heavens and fruitful seasons and satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowd from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from the Antioch and from Iconium and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Okay, you're in there, you're, you're, you're talking about Jesus Christ, you're seeing all kinds of people come to Christ. There's rejoicing, and then there's that opposition once again. You see that? There's that opposition once again. This time, it was physical. Now, we all know that there's physical opposition to the gospel. All you have to do is look up online, China, Iran, Iraq, whatever it may be, and you'll see that there's physical opposition. There's physical opposition here in the United States that we don't hear about a lot of times. So here's Paul and Barnabas. They're trying to keep the crowds back in their humbleness to give God the glory. They're sitting there trying to talk to them, and then here comes this other crowd coming in, throwing what? Stones at them. 
Put yourself in there. Put yourself in the crowd. They stoned him and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. And the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and they had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of heaven. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commanded, uh, commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia, and from Pamphylia, when they had spoken the word at Perga, they went down to Attilia. From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. There is perseverance in persecution they were unashamed of their mission paul and barnabas were unashamed because of the preparations that they had taken to preach the gospel you see we need to be prepared each and every day to preach the gospel we need to be prepared one of our prayers in the morning should be lord you know what as i go wherever i'm going allow me to partner with you and allow me to tell somebody about you unashamedly and give you the glory that you need and so well deserve. Notice they only got to plant a seed here. They only got to plant a seed. They found common ground with the people there. It, they were talking about a monotheistic God. It means one God. You see, they were living in a world of polytheism, which means that they had many gods. In fact, these folks worshipped Zeus and the Greek mythology gods. We live in a polytheistic society, in a postmodern society today. There's a number of beliefs about who God is. And Paul stood on that and he grabbed that and he said, hey, you know what? Let me tell you about just this one God. Let me tell you about this one living God who loves you and you know this. How do you know it? You don't have to think about or wish about the God to come down. All you have to do is look at the nature around you. You see, he said he's the one that has given you the heavens, the rains, the fruitfulness, the sun. You see, here's this God who testifies himself through nature. He gave witness to himself. This is the God that you need to be worshiping. This is the God that you need to know. Let me ask you something this morning. Are you here serving a dead mythological God or gods? Is your God dead? Is it made up of fairy tales? Is he made up of fairy tales? Is he made up of wood? Is he made up of stone? Is he made up of a box? Is he made up of a car? A dead God. A dead God in which when you try to go and you try to talk to somebody, you can't persevere in. You see, Paul was saying, hey, there's a living God and you need to turn away from these vain idols, he said. Vain idols. Those are the woods. Those are everything that we have in our life that we put before God. I care what it is. Job, money, family, whatever it is. Self. Probably the biggest God we have this day and age is self. He's saying you need to turn from them. What's that word mean? Turn from those vain idols? It means to repent. We need to repent from those. And we need to turn from those. And we need to tell God, you know what? I'm sorry about those. Help me find out who you are. Help and strengthen me to persevere. There's only one living God and he cares for you. You know, even the atheists this day and age say that there's no God. But we need to understand that eternity has been planted in their hearts, folks. 
Eternity has been planted in everybody's heart and will until God comes back. We need to understand that we need to tell them about a living God like Paul and Barnabas has. And we need to tell them that if they'll call out to him, he'll show them great and mighty things. And first and foremost, what he'll show them is a transformed heart from stone to flesh. A transformed heart and a transformed life. You see, he'll give us grit through suffering. He'll give us grit through suffering, folks. Opposition came and they stoned Paul. Now I want you to understand this. That it wasn't like what we used to do with kids where they get those little gravels and we'd throw them at each other and things like that. That's not what, that's not what stoning meant. We're talking big stones. We're talking stones in which they could probably very hardly even shove over their heads. And they were hitting Paul with these big rocks. They knocked him down. They knocked him out. They bruised him. And not only did they knock him out and bruise him, they came over and they drug him out of the city and the city uh, gates and threw him out in the, outside the city. All over the gospel. All over the gospel. But what did Paul do? Everybody came around him. They all thought he was dead. Yeah, they were probably trying to protect him too. All the disciples came around him. But what did he do? Where most of us would have stayed down and said, heck with it. Paul slowly got up. I imagine he tried to get his balance a little bit. And what did he do? He turned right back in and walked right back into the gate. He, he knew the love of God and he knew what the love of God had done for him and he was going to go right back in and he was going to tell them about who Jesus Christ was to him. He saw the risen Savior and it was going to take a lot more to discourage him from telling the unfailing, never giving up love of God through Jesus Christ. Are we like it? Are we like this? You know what? The first words that people say or whatever it is that, that, that hurts our emotions, we're just out of it. We're gone. We're down. We're out. Knocked out. I don't care what happens. I don't care what the gospel is. I don't care. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm hurt. I'm scarred. Not Paul. I can remember in a WWF match. I might have watched maybe one or two. But Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan was down on the floor. And boy, everybody was all on him and out. And then all of a sudden you heard that music playing. Dun, 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 and that finger came out. And you saw that finger moving. Boy, you know that meant that, you know, trouble was coming. He's getting back up. Folks, that's what we need to be doing. Even if we get knocked out, even if we get hurt, even if we get scarred, whatever it may be as a church or individual or wherever we're at, we need to remember that we need to get up and we need to go and we need to share the love of Jesus Christ. And we're not worried about these folks over here who want to hurt us. There's perseverance in it. Are we like this? The first aid kit we need is this, knowing God's word. And the gospel of his love, prayer and fasting, strength of the Holy Spirit, and tenacity to forgive others. The big thing that holds us up so many times is the tenacity of not forgiving others. Jesus Christ forgave us. We should forgive others. And when we forgive others, we can persevere. Fourthly, there's perseverance in devotion. There's perseverance in devotion. We looked at it in verse 20 through 28. They continued to preach no matter the hurt. They continued to move on and continued to preach. They made many disciples. And they went back and they encouraged the new churches. Did you see where they came back and they, they left and they went back the way they came to encourage the new churches, to, to, to let them know that they needed to persevere even in this persecution. It's the same that we should be doing. 
We should be doing the same, folks. We should be lifting each other up. We should be encouraging other churches around us to continue on the fight, to continue to spread the gospel. They organized the churches. They appointed elders. And through the first aid kits, they taught people how to persevere. They gathered the church together when they got back to Antioch to tell them what happened. You know what? Folks, don't ever, ever not tell what Jesus Christ has done for you in your life on a daily basis to someone. Rejoice it. The church needs to know. That's how we get our perseverance. They, they rejoiced for the doors of the gospel that had been opened. So are we rejoicing with the Lord in the doors he's opening here at the church, folks? Are we rejoicing? I hope that you are. God's doing a mighty work. He continues to confirm things to the leadership as we move forward. I hope that you're rejoicing about the things. Because if you're not, you're missing out. You're missing out on his love. You're missing out on his mercy and his grace. And you're missing out on not being able to move forward with us. Maybe it's in your lives. Maybe you're not rejoicing in your life. A while back, Laura and I had an opportunity to go to the beach. And at the beach, we were sitting out there. There was this little crippled girl who was on a boogie board. She didn't have much use of her left side. She would kind of go out into the ocean on her boogie board, and every time she'd go out, she'd get rolled. And she had trouble getting up. She tried and she tried to get out there far enough so she could just ride the waves in, just like all the other kids. Each time she'd try, that wave would just roll her. Another one would push her under and bring her to shore. Each time she'd go under, we didn't know why, if she was going to come up or not. We were on the edge of our seats thinking, man, we got to go out there and get her. You know what? We watched as she would try and try again to get far enough out so she could enjoy the ride, but each time those waves toppled her. Yet an amazing thing happened. Each time someone would come and pick her up out of the water and get her back on the feet, get her back on her feet. She couldn't get up. So somebody come, we'd see some, uh, one of the kids or someone coming, they'd pick her up and she'd shake off. The kids would go on and she'd try it again. Her perseverance was astonishing. She would start right back out and bam, a wave would wash her and knock her over again. We figured out later that that was probably her brothers or sisters that were coming and picking her up and standing her upright. Finally, she just laid on the board's edge, right at the edge of the lapping waves. She was wore out. She was resting. We thought it was over. But when right when we thought it was over, she got up again, and she started going out. Out of the corner of our eyes as she went out a big wave just came and just toppled her I mean she went under we were sitting there kind of like oh no and then out of the other corner of our other eye we saw someone hurrying over to her and he picked her up in his arms it was her dad He made sure she was all right. He asked her if she wanted to go in, and she shook her head. No, she wanted to stay. So he helped her out to the waves, something she's been trying to do for an hour. He put her on the board, and the wave came, and she rode it with a big smile on her face. Time and time again, he done it. He picked her up in his arms. You see, we watched through tears as she enjoyed her father picking her up and doing it over and over again. We cried as we watched because we realized it was a picture of perseverance. How ministry is. That's how ministry is, folks. 
you got to have the perseverance. You get, when you're knocked down, you have to get back up again. When you're knocked down, you have to get back up again. And you can't get it back in your own strength. It's only through the strength of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ that we have strength enough to get back up and persevere for Jesus Christ. Every time we're hurt, every time we're bruised, every time we're scarred, our love for the Father through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, allows us to persevere through bandaging our hearts, allowing us to forgive, binding up the wounds to allow us to continue to minister to those around us. Or it might give you hope that you're looking for this morning. Understanding the Father wants you to understand whatever it is crippling you, whatever it is this morning crippling you from having that perseverance and that right relationship with Him. Bitterness, anger, addiction to drugs, alcohol, worry, anxiousness of life, He will take it away from you if you trust Him to do that. You've got to have that intense faith and allow him to work through that situation. If you'll just come. Maybe you need the free gift of Jesus Christ this morning. Maybe you don't have that relationship. Maybe you're looking for that, and you're looking for that perseverance, and, and that crippling thing, whatever it is, just is all over you. It's like those waves. This morning, come to Jesus Christ. Come to him. It's a free gift. He died on the cross for you and for me. His blood covered our sins. He was buried and he was raised again. And he can change your life this morning. He can transform it. And he'll pick you up every time a wave hits you. Give him the glory for his work in your life and in the church's life. Be a bold witness for him no matter the stones that stone. Be, be unashamed to associate with him in everyday life. What is he speaking to you this morning? How are you going to respond? Will you allow him to give you the strength to persevere and bandage your wounds this morning? No matter where you're at, who you are. Will you allow your scars to be the testimony of him? As Sandy and the musicians come, we're going to have a time of invitation. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to talk to me. I'll be all right up here. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you about salvation. I'll talk to you about perseverance. Whatever it may need. The need is on your heart. I'll do it. Maybe you're here this morning and you want to join this congregation. This congregation is a great congregation. The Lord continues to work with us. And we continue to partner with Him. Maybe today's the day you need to come. Maybe you just need to come to the altar and pray. You know what? I can always use your prayers. This church can always use your prayers as we continue to go out in the community. Or maybe you just need to come and ask God about something between you and him. You do it as we sing this hymn of invitation.